So good morning, everyone. Seems to always be a full house in Boulder when you hold anything about Tibet or Buddhism. Of course, in this case, we've invited a whole lot of people here, so we got a leg up, but it's nice to see a full house. So welcome to the Lotsawas from our workshop and also to uh, some students and community members who are also joining us. So this is our keynote for the Lotsawa Translation Workshop, and we're so honored to have Lama Jap from Oxford University, who is the Lever Hume uh, early career scholar uh, there. And um, actually, Lama Jap was here a year ago for Himalayan Studies Conference, uh, the fifth in that series, and we were all so wowed, we uh, supplicated him to come back. <laughs> So really, really happy. Um, and his work is so pertinent to what we're doing in this workshop in terms of thinking about Tibetan verse and um, especially the issues of orality um, and how oral traditions and literary traditions sort of are interwoven, overlap, have um, similarities and differences. And this is an area of um, specialization for uh, Lama Jap, very interested in the oral tradition, um, also an incredible um, fluency with theory, translation theory, literary, liter literary theory, and so I feel like we're going to be um, well prepared and well cultivated by him to um, pursue more discussion about uh, literary style and translation. And I particularly appreciate in his title, you know, so often we take theory from other places and we sort of slap it on to our Tibetan materials. And it's so great to have the main theoretical framework, and I'm completely intrigued by this, being the bardo, you know, and thinking about perhaps um, translation as a rebirthing process. So um, Lama Jop's work, The Inescapable Nation, has been very um, important, and he also, um, he also is somebody who's deeply informed by um, readings of contemporary Tibetan literature. He himself has composed some poetry, I just found out, and he's a, a master translator of poetry. So uh, I think he brings a unique blend of theory and poetic style even to his lecture style. So please join me in warmly welcoming Lama Jab. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Uh, I am really, really humbled. Um, and uh, I would like to thank Zanda and the organizing, the conference organizers for inviting me here to give this keynote. Um, and I would like to thank all of you for being here. Thank you very much. It is an honor and a daunting task to stand before so many accomplished translators and scholars today. Uh, and I am extremely grateful for such an opportunity. So before I begin, I would like to dedicate my keynote lecture uh, to my late beloved friend and colleague, Gangatsang, Tserantondrup, Tserantondrup Gangatsang. He was an accomplished uh, teacher and translator who had really dedicated his entire
And, um, you know, we all miss him really much, and he wanted to be here, and uh, alas, he's not here. Mertagbarwa, impermanence of life, there we go. But this is dedicated to him, a great being. To find a single Tibetan writer worth uh, their, sorry, technology. I think technology is in Bardo. <laughs> Stuck in Bardo. OK, here now. <laughs> Um, one would be hard pressed uh, to find a single Tibetan writer um, worth their salt who hasn't dabbled in writing poetry. In fact, it would be extremely difficult to find one literary Tibetan who hasn't tried their hand at composing poems. Likewise, Tibetan oral culture is saturated with poetry. A Tibetan proverb tells us, In every Tibetan mouth, there is a song. To claim not to know song is no Tibetan. I think it is not an exaggeration to say that poetry is in the Tibetan DNA. Therefore, translation of poetry is vital for a more nuanced and fuller understanding of Tibet and for a more meaningful communication with the Tibet. As all of you know, only too well, although highly rewarding, translation is no easy task. Translation operates in a liminal, bardo-like zone between two languages, a communicative act between two separate worlds. It requires scrupulous dismantling of the original text before its substance can be transported into the target language. This is like the complex dissolution of the corporeal existence before one's death. The target language itself also goes through a process of deconstruction before being reassembled to absorb the content and sometimes even the form of the original. Walter Benjamin concludes his The Task of the Translator by stating, to some degree, all great texts contain their potential translation between the lines. When we appreciate this enigmatic statement, within the context of Benjamin's notion of translation as survival, then it is within the interstices of words and lines that we find the roaming consciousness and the potential for translation. And also the potential of course, for the rebirth of poetry. Like a journey through the Bardo realm, translation is full of pitfalls and enlightening opportunities. I will talk about these challenges and rewards drawing on my own experiences as a translator. Through my translations, I will demonstrate my attempts to assist the rebirth of Tibetan poems in English. Time permitting, I will read out my examples both in Tibetan and English. I usually recite the Tibetan original, so not that because I'm in love with my own voice, um, but so as to present some aspects of its sound, cadence, and mood, as well as to highlight the obvious fact that the English rendition is a recasting. Although translation is enriching in various ways, it also entails destructive violence, in that sometimes it has the tendency 
to erase the original in the memory of the target language reader. By reciting the source material, I am foregrounding the continued life of the Tibetan original, and by extension, the continued life of the Tibetan language. And I'm also pointing out that my translation takes one closer to the original poem, but it is in no way the real thing. Is that big enough? Okay. Let me start with a typical formulaic beginning of a Tibetan wedding recital. I won't give a speech, I said, but I am besieged to give a speech. When a great man gives a speech, it's like the vulture cutting through the high heavens. As it flies and flies, the higher it soars, yet it needs the mental alertness that its wingtips won't touch the extremity of the skies. When a middling man gives a speech, it's like the brown eagle swooping down to its nest. As it swoops down and down, the lower it falls. Yet it needs the mental alertness that its wingtips won't touch the rock. When a lesser man like myself gives a speech, it's like the blue pigeon foraging for food. It needs to look to the right, it needs to look to the listen to the left, it needs to bend down and down to pick it up, it needs to hunch over and over to swallow it. These are some of the many Tibetan formulaic expressions for the act of public speaking that describes and instructs the potential speech maker. I think they would also serve as apt metaphors especially the blue pigeon in my case, for translators of varying competencies. By the way, this excerpt um, is no indication of my response when I was approached to give this speech. Uh, I jumped at the opportunity saying many a resounding yes, and with the lightning speed of the brown eagle, of course. But the works of the Accomplished translate, translators might appear graceful and effortless like the flight of the vulture and the eagle. But behind them lie many hours of hardship, headache, and mental alertness. Like the blue pigeon foraging for food, the act of translation in general is an arduous process that requires heightened senses, diligence, and even existential danger. In spite of all these factors that go into the act of translation, something of the original still remains uncommunicated. In particular, translation of poetry is deemed to be ever more difficult, if not impossible. Arthur Schopenhauer writes, poems can be translated. They can, but sorry, poems cannot be translated. They can only be transposed, and that is always awkward. Percy B. Shelley goes further and speaks of the vanity of translation, and posits that it were as wise to cast a violet into the crucible that you might discover the formal principles of its color and order as seek to transfuse from one language into another the creations of a poet. The plant must spring again from its seed, or it will bear no fruit. And this is the burden of the curse of 
Babel. As poetry is a specific fusion of words and musical elements, I take heed of this notion of the untranslatability of poetry. If poetry is what Samuel Taylor Coleridge claims it is, the best words in their best order, then translation inevitably disrupts this scrupulous ordering. Kavya influenced Tibetan, poet, Tibetan scholars and poets state that poetry is an arrangement of words that is melodious to the ear. John Dredden's definition of poetry as the harmony of words wouldn't be an unfaithful translation of nyanga, the Tibetan term for poetry. Once again, this accentuated element of harmony might fade into discord when a poem is transported out of one language into another, even with the translator's best efforts to retain it. Regardless of the seemingly insurmountable obstacles, it is also a simple fact that without the labor of translation, there wouldn't be much poetic communication across cultures divided by language, let alone any possibility of overcoming that perennial linguistic confusion captured by the Tower of Babel story. Indeed, Tibetan scholars acknowledge the illuminating role of transla translation in opening one's eyes to, the, to a foreign world. When they referentially address the accomplished translator, Lozawa, in Sanskrit, and in Tibetan, Jihtin Mu, the eyes of the world. Tibetan translators don't seem to dwell much over the untranslatability of poetry, but get on with the task in hand. The ninth century royal decree on translation found in Dabjur Bambu Niwa, the Tibetan and Sanskrit glossary of Buddhist technical terms, respects the syntax of the original language, but it is more concerned with the transference of the meaning. It instructs the translator to retain the order of words or sentences, both in prose and verse, but change it if it doesn't make any proper sense in Tibetan. Indeed, I mean, I, regardless of this seemingly, in, sorry, indeed, I mean, Tibetan scholars acknowledge this, but also I take this practical royal kind of reflection on translation seriously. So it might be impossible to transport, to borrow Shelley's words, a certain uniform and harmonious recurrence of sound within a specific poem in a specific tongue into another. However, it is still possible to transfer some of its subtle qualities concerning sense, tone, imagery, and general meaning. It is also possible for the translation to carry over the heightened emotions and thoughts that constitute poetry. I will now present some of my translations for appraisal to see how I both succeed and fail in assisting the rebirth of Tibetan poems in English. We will see if my translations are still stuck in that twilight bardo realm between the Tibetan and English language, or if they can be considered worthy reincarna reincarnations, <laughs> English or American reincarnations or English-speaking reincarnations. <laughs> Let us look at an excerpt from a Mangur poem by the great monk scholar, poet, Shantun Hatambar Jamtso. Nyang lama chenbu chakpa chen, tig khernik da bi vjigdi imel, tor gongon hto bi fshargul te, 
Cos, how in Havi Rolancor. Zee, Kurzin told me, don't you pa? Ka, lapa nigga that demil. Sa, reptaxi, tatsiti, che mure mure that dumil. Hane, a return then beer gumchin ba? Don't chim go in the nearbunta. Yen long tongue then beer, young toti, son, cookie cookie rem tanyel. Yen gosam tondo muchin so. The younger younger Sunday mill. Tor Zadaniel we howdy, co Tawita in Dudu mill. The Lama, known for his greatness and fame, is never present when besieged by the pillow dying. The vulture that soars high in the blue sky circles over the corpse with its wings flap, flap. The ritualist who forages for food offerings never ceases to move his mouth and hands. Pickers and mice on the ground and amidst the cracks never cease to move their muzzle, nibble, nibble. The great yogi who roams through wild mountains wanders at villages' doors collecting fistfuls of barley. The hungry wolf that roams the empty valleys by day, by night prowls the encampment's age, sneak, sneak. Powerful men who crave after fame and status Never tire, though hardship accumulate on the way. The stag that wanders through high rock mountains never for a moment stays still, stumble, stumble. This is an excerpt from the epilogue to Shantun Tambar Jamsu's Habshanuru in Tonga, the Rosary of Advice Jewels, a famous track of elegant sayings consisting of fine verses of advice. Here, our poet attacks the hypocrisy, irresponsibility, avarice, dishonesty of high lamas, monk ritualists, ascetic yogis, and powerful Tibetan men. They're always usually men. Who are likened to restless, hunger-driven vultures, rodents, wolves, and stags. He does so through the employment of one of the best loved meters of Tibetan guru poetry, and a unique expressive poetic device. I used technical Latinate terms for classifying the meter of this guru in my book, The Inescapable Nation. I believe I was wrong to employ such vocabulary for explaining Tibetan arrangement of rhythm. I don't think I got the meter in English anyway. <laughs> At the time, I deludedly thought that I knew the English meter. Now, especially after reading Ted Hughes' brilliant essay on myths, meters, and rhythms, and given that even great English language poets disagree over what a certain poem's meter is, I have no idea how to classify this Tibetan verse according to the English metrical system. To say simply, this guru excerpt is a syllabic verse written in four line stanzas, with each line consisted of eight syllables. When scanning a line for rhythm, the first and the last syllables are read on their own. A slight pause of breath follows the first syllable and precedes the last syllable of a line. The remaining six syllables in the middle are read in pairs. To put it another way, within each line, two monosyllables frame three disyllables. For example, Nyang, Lama, Chimbu, Trakpa, Jan, Tu, Hurni, Tapi, Jigdu, Mel, To, Gungun, Topi, it is quite impossible to trans translate the metrical pattern, cadence, alliteration, and other sound-based qualities of a Tibetan poem into English. Foregrounding the musical dimension, Edgar Allan Poe defines the poetry of words 
as the rhythmical creation of beauty. Alas, as you can see in my translation of this ngur, I impair that sound-forged beauty by failing to mirror the Tibetan arrangement of rhythm. A more accomplished translator with a musical ear and a deeper knowledge of English prosody might be able to translate the musical mode of this Tibetan verse into English. However, as Andre Lefebvre notes, such metrical translation might only be achieved at the expense of the poetic text as a whole. As a result, in this translation, I took the advice of John Dridden and varied the dress in an effort not to alter or destroy the substance. I must, um, it must be said that although no metrical translation is attempted here, the English rendering might still have faint echoes of the rhythm and cadence of the Tibetan original, which after all still serves as a source of inspiration in a subtle metrical sense. Another fundamental element of this Nguru poem is the use of the ancient and prevalent Tibetan poetic device that embellishes the last line of each stanza. It is formed of phrases that are visually, orally, kinetically, rhythmically descriptive in an untranslatable way. Commenting on the archaic song, songs in the Donghuang documents or manuscripts, Roger Jackson identifies these rhetoric traits as reduplicated, troubled, onomatic peg phrases. In his analysis of a subversive recitation by the Bhutanese wandering bards, Michael Aris calls these figures <clears throat> that well-known poetic device of reduplicated syllables having no lexical value, employed to describe specific appearances or situations. However, this poetic Phrases are not just for conveying rhythmic sound or producing alliterative pattern and syllabic meter. They are lexically rooted and are nuanced imagistic representations of both abstract and concrete realities or entities being described. On top of the onomatic peg qualities, they add visual images of the action scene and object in question. These include highly perceptive, vivid descriptions of specific sense, motions or movements which breathe life into the entities being portrayed. Within them, one finds the heightened sensibility of the poet and the impressionable and vivid imagination of the reader. These turns of phrase are sometimes are some of the distinctive Tibetan linguistic features Gendon Chumpil singles out in his Tamjil Tama, spread out gold tales, for their poetic quality and laments the fact that they hardly feature in formal caviar influenced Tibetan verse. These image-laden onomatic peg figures, busy with action, sound, and sense, form part of what Gendon Chimpil calls Pami Likjitsugyur, the ancestral diction, or Workal Rangongwi Diksal, the diction according to the natural freedom of the Tibetan language. Gendon Chumpil advances the notion, this notion of a flexible poetic diction naturally inherent within the Tibetan language that is unrestricted by the artificial strived style of the Tibetan caviar 
sorry, Indian caviar influenced Tibetan literature. This is something very similar to what Ted Hughes calls poets' use of words according to their natural quantity. That is the observation of the emphasis on and time value given to words in natural conversational speech. My translation here captures the action packed aspect of these phrases, but it doesn't quite manage to convey the evocative descriptions of a movement or an appearance. For example, the line circles over the corpse with the wings flap, flap doesn't reproduce that ungainly, awkward, desperate flight of the hungry vulture distilled in Kol Hawe Hawe Rolankur. This clumsy, macabre flight contrasts sharply with the masterful flight of the white vulture that cuts through the high heavens, which I recited at the start of my talk. Although my translation is nowhere near adequate regarding the importation of this poetic device, I believe it does relate Shanton Tambar Jamso's critical spirit and a bit of his zesty style. However, our challenge is to find a way of translating these poetic turns of phrase that does justice, even a modicum, to their expressiveness, rhythmic beauty, and visual intensity. Just take a quick look at this list of such poetic epithets for the color white alone, compiled by my late cousin Tibetan poet and essayist Ndatsen Bangon Botserang. It offers us a blizzard of images and actions and sounds dressed in white. I'm afraid it looks like uh, we have our translation work cut out for us. <laughs> Another page. <laughs> <laughs> this leads me to close this leads me to a closely sort of related issue. The difficulties we encounter when translating the Tibetan poetic image. Both Tibetan written and oral poetry are obsessed with the similes, metaphors, and all kinds of figurative speech. Not only Wyndham Lewis's dictum that image is the primary pigment of poetry applies to the Tibetan poetry, but also the Tibetan fixation with it result in poems bursting with the imagery. Such poetic compositions don't lend themselves easily to translation. For example, here is a caviar verse by the great fifth Dalai Lama, overflowing with images, who we encountered last night, maybe on the mountaintop or not. <laughs> Sorry, let me have a sip of water because this is like 27 syllables. Each line is 27. <laughs> Hyangsal dipji, shower jang we, chigri in kuri huina, Montuk lawi, renchener dam, tabi wagamna, Galwi kermang, jachi sapang, luxil kamcha, tama gandi, Saturnar we dipter at the Gamakjan ma, Nyamjin jork kachir nam, jalik pen me, rendel herlin, Setun mandi, send me a wang jar tan chick jang, Monjul adam wadi in tansi, tamjin gurti, rayon chang manda. Lord and the Jefferson Tugli Zanchev Joyen Mun. Inside the towering heavenly mansion of heaped jewel dust books, amid an encircling bulwark bound and reinforced by the fusion of vowels and consonants, 
resides the wild-eyed beauty of a well-structured annals that abandons the cooktry of heavy inconsistencies and deceptions and distills all the essences of the finest writings. Her beautiful dances of emotional expression embrace the seven melodies of verse, prose, and their blend, while sidelong glances of words and their meaning unmixed flash like the rainbow. And this woman, adorned with a damwara garland of caviar cannings, with the traces of tails cascading on her left, can be relished by none but the Indras of wisdom. This is how the great fifth concludes his history of Tibet, which he likens to the call of the cuckoo, the Tibetan annal song of the spring queen. In his verse, the great fifth eschews his usual utterances of humility and eulogizes his history for its poetic language, consistency, truthfulness, orderly structure, semantic clarity, wealth of references, and sheer intellectual force. He identifies these worthy features of his book through, to borrow a phrase from John Stuart Mill, an exuberance of imagery. The profusion of imagery seems to be both a strength and a weakness of the great fifth's poetry. In these lines, a heavy heap of metaphors and simile borrowed from classical Tibetan literature, and no, no, classical Kavya literature, Indian influenced literature, and mythology, Indian mythology, also suffocates, the, almost suffocates the meaning. The whole stanza is an example of what Tibetan Kavya poets calls the adornment of total metaphor. In such an instance, the principal metaphor here, the beautiful woman, is further elaborated with the subsidiary metaphors through this stanza, such as, such as her graceful dance, flashing eyes, cascading hair, that corresponds to the history book and each of its perceived qualities. My translation imparts the overall meaning, but loses the polished yet somewhat labored meter, as well as some of its complex index Indian allusions. Maybe Walter Benjamin is right when he states that translations proved to be untranslatable, not because of any inherent difficulty, but because of the looseness with which meaning attaches to them. This verse by the Great Fifth contains Tibetan translations of Sanskrit terms and concepts, some of them serving as images, as can be seen in the highlighted um, slate, uh, slide. In a, in a way, the Kavik style itself is also a form of translation. Despite these aspects being hard to translate, my rendition brings out the bulk of the imagery, beat in a stilted, awkward, metrical vehicle, lacking the strived majesty of the original. Let me present another contrasting poetic composition that is, both, that is also exploding with an excess of conceits. In Dabchik Machusif Shapa Ripi the treasury of intellect narrating the worldly tale of the winged ones, a beautiful narrative belonging to the genre of bird stories, the villain, Miss Mr. Sparrow comes across the nest of the Mrs. Swallow and the Swallow family. He sees Mrs. Swallow asleep within it. To him, Mrs. Swallow appears something like this. 
Teyang me womanda, she simon dawa. Tangsakpa labdana, kanglak, to nyema labdana, shalak, nyetam samchi, solema. Yatola tabjarawa, matola and debjarawa, social la lujarawa, mamala rabjarawa, kurturila, sedang, tangon la ribdan korwa. Arton yanchela taun diwa samcha, samcha, samcha tamba sam, rawa. Sakang tamotang tati, kanan de chang, jenyang dopa. Chotin scatching tang tati, kanan de ting, skunyang dopa. Nurkin melon tang tati, kanan de chang, tanyang dopa. Nurk tao tang tati, kanan de chang, shunyang dopa. She do. She appears not like the daughter of a human, but the daughter of a god. When in cold wind she is about to freeze, when in warm sunshine she is about to melt, and in between the shade and sun she sparkles. Her upper brow is worth a hundred horses, her lower brow is worth a hundred deeds. Her white teeth are worth a hundred sheep. Her eyebrows are worth a hundred goats. Over her right cheek circles a golden bee, over her left cheek circles a turquoise bee. Her neck is worth 330 horses and donkeys mixed. She's like the shimmering temple. Wherever she is, one wants to pay homage to her. She's like the little white stupa. Wherever she is, one wants to circumambulate her. She's like the white silver mirror. Wherever she is, one wants to look at her. She is like a fine steed. Wherever she is, one wants to mount her. Don't read too much into that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my translation manages to reflect the fast pace, lovely tone, and the stream of imagery that conveys a sense of delicate beauty and irresistible attraction. I might have even caught a tiny weeny bit of maybe something of the tempo of its style, which Frederick Nish believes is the most difficult quality to translate. However, it does not transfuse the alliterative Tibetan sound patterns, propelling rhythm, and heighten the subtle cultural references that underpin the images. In this passage, set expressions and images are piled up, not just to hammer home a single message or to enhance overall rhythm and rhetoric function, but also to bring into relief a Tibetan notion of beauty by exposing wider cultural perspectives and values. For instance, the evaluation of Mrs. Swallow's beauty in terms of different types of livestock communicates her stunning looks as well as the esteemed value of domestic animals in that specific community. The finding of irresistible charm in the shimmering temple, the little white stupa, the silver mirror and the fine steed is revealing about the prominent role of these entities in Tibetan society. These similes unveil Mrs. Swallow's charm as well as make us explore the holy, beautiful, priceless things that she is compared to. Within these things, we discover a wider cultural world which feeds both aesthetic and moral attitudes. I try to be faithful to the original as much as possible and did not add interpretive words or adjectives such as sacred, precious, brilliant, to, max to sort of magnify the cultural significance of the images to the target language reader. This literalism still imparts the relentless flow of poetic images, but does not enhance a reader's cultural sensibility for a more complex appreciation of the Tibetan original. Serious linguistic obstacles the translator encounters are interconnected with and compounded by 
aspects of what um, J.C. Cutford identifies as cultural untranslatability. When faced with such challenges, I try to strike a balance between extreme literalism and absolute liberty in an effort to capture the cultural nuances. If I believe a word or a concept is quite untranslatable, then I try to, then I try to coin a new term, Tibetan the English, by pro prioritizing the cultural reference by keeping the Tibetan term untranslated. Let me cite a free verse poem called A Realm by one of the most celebrated Tibetan contemporary poets, Shchepchen Didul. Shankamchi, the big lerkiji, Rodanan Kasseler, Tong, Yitirwatan Birdoma, Jerjer song. Shoki Kirby, Shenangyan, Jerjer song. Lightning streaked out of the dimpled meadow. Water swirled in the hoofprints of the deer. A rainbow came out in the mist and gained one more nameless color. Dew foamed on the plaits of beautiful nomad women. On the summit of the distant snow mountain, the hallowed eyes of peace and stars twinkling. When a crack of the sling brought down the dark and began erasing the crimson horizon clouds, amidst the sun smoke were warriors in their armor, bristling. Inside the cedar pail were conch white arrows of milk pulsing. At that moment, the bass voice brightened the inside of the yak hair tent with brilliant light. The longing for the exiles became heavier. The seeming joy borne by the life force too became heavier. This is a tribute poem to the famous Tibetan Donlin singer, Debe, who is affectionately known to Tibetans as Kangjong Kigmunmo, the blue cuckoo of the snowland. In a sense, the bay became the contemporary Tibetan cuckoo, um, thereby perpetuating the Tibetan sort of archetypal significance of the cuckoo. This is the cuckoo that uh, sang the bone and Buddhist teachings, and the very same cuckoo that narrated the Tibetan history for the great or through the great fifth Dalai Lama. Jefchen Dedel's poem contextualizes the base birth by embedding it within Tibetan imperial history and martial spirit, nomadic culture, and dark contemporary times. The sublime wonders of nature gracing Tibetan pastoral life welcomed the bay into the world. The grassland, the snow mountain, the yak hair tent, the Tibetan wilds and climate, nomad women, warriors greet him. But a descending darkness also threatens to erase the Tibetan civilization. I have left one word partially translated, partially untranslated, and another translated in a strict, in a kind of strictly literal sense, in order to reflect the poem's historical and cultural context. Firstly, the word Sangtal could be rendered loosely as sacred smoke or purifying fire smoke or something along those lines. But such a translation would not convey the history, ritual, and cultural significance enmeshed within the term. I left Sang as an alien object so as to whet the reader's cultural appetite for the original text. 
believing that it would serve as a portal to the Tibetan culture, cultural world. Secondly, Omi Tonda could be translated more smoothly and aptly as conch white darts of milk. However, this does not get across the bold martial imagery hearkening back to the Tibetan imperial military might. The conch white arrows of milk is more literal, but it hasn't got that smooth, flawless effect in English. On the other hand, the image of arrows does bring forth the Tibetan military spirit that imbues the preceding line and which is attributed to the hero of the poem, the Bey, who sings the contemporary Tibet with such valor and passion. In his seminal work, The Translator's Invisibility, Lawrence Venuti recommends foreignization as a strategy for countering the dominance of fluency or the illusion of transparency that makes the translator and the conditions under which he or she operates disappear. My concern is with the linguistic and cultural invisibility of the Tibetan original text in highly fluent, transparent translations. Translations that appear as if they're written in target language, in the target language leaving not even the faintest traces of the original. I believe that, that occasional foreignization, in my case, Tibetanization, would help the English reader be conscious of the source language and appreciate its cultural metrics. Let me briefly demonstrate my point through two excerpts from an extraordinary poem on 10th March called The Anniversary and the Melody, by another acclaimed contemporary Tibetan poet, Sandur. That's for 10th March. Yongma tsang ma an dro ma re to lo, hon jik tin da na har gang jong ma ngo lo, ka chi pa li ngak tar jang lan tin, ka nam sin tham ni jie shik drak chir ng kor. I'm not going to do that in English because that's untranslatable. But all the people who come are people who must go. This perishable world has many a high and a low. Sing the tune of Kachi Palu far into the distance, and from the horizon something bounces back as an echo. From here over towards the region where the sun sets, thus is it written in a passage of an early Dharmic text. Despair is the circling of vultures with, with the wings flapping. Defeat is the spreading of mutak with the tassels flipping. Sandu's poem on the Tibetan National Uprising Day is composed of 30 stanzas, and these two are selected from different parts of it. They therefore do not reflect the overall fluidity and coherence of the poem. As you can tell in these excerpts, two Tibetan terms are left untranslated. This is the case because through them, and other similar instances, I want to reveal the complex cultural setting of the poem and its highly intertextual nature. These foreign terms maintain a Tibetan presence in the English translation, as well as drawing our attention to Terry Eagleton's belief that translation entails going beyond the text as a given datum. Eagleton states, every text is a set of determinate transformations of other preceding and surrounding texts of which it may, be even, may, may not even be consciously aware. It is within 
Against and across this are the texts that the poem emerges into being. And these other texts, in their turn, tissues of such pre-existent textual elements, which can never be unrivaled back into some primordial moment of origin. The untranslatable and untranslated words in my translation serve as doorways to the tangled web of literary texts and socio-cultural tissues that make up the poem. For instance, in the first excerpt, Sandor draws, our, Sandor draws on Tibetan literary or, and oral traditions by borrowing the memorable meter, cadence, and wisdom of Kachipalu, a famous 18th century lyrical and popular aphoristic work. Thus, the tune of Kachipalu is employed to discover, fathom, and augment the surge of a deep melody the poet detects in contemporary Tibet. The second cited, in the second cited stanza, the Tibetan word mutak introduced, introduces an intriguing foreign presence. I guess one could translate it loosely as sky rope or soul rope, but this would lose or dilute the symbolic richness of mutak and would also fail to inject that spirit of the for foreign works recommended by Rudolf Panitz. As many of you know, mutak is a long cord loosely spun, predominantly white wool, which, with the tassels running along the entire lengths of the robe. Mutak has great mythic and symbolic significance, and it is believed that it bridges death and the afterlife, as well as the earth and the sky. In a way, it's like a bardo robe. Indeed, all the Tibetan historical texts often state that some of the earliest Tibetan kings used mutak to travel to the heavens after their death, thus leaving no corporeal remains. To this day, such mysterious robes are stretched out on the ground when performing sky burials for the dead. Here, Sandor is referencing this funereal function to highlight despair, death, and defeat that characterize today's Tibet. But the mythic chord stretches back and beyond the immediate text into pre-existing textual and cultural elements. Retaining such multivalent words and images in the English translation moves the reader closer to the language of the poet, as well as mitigating that obliterating violence that translation sometimes inflects. In his illuminating play, Translations, Brian Friles shows how the 19th century English translations of Irish place names erases Irish history, cultural memory, and identity. The foreignization strategy even the transliteration of a single word or a nature or a name is sometimes effective for highlighting the continued life of the original language and the past historical and cultural forces and meanings that have shaped it and that remain submerged within it. Leaving culturally loaded terms untranslated or bracketing original words or phrases within the translated text might be necessary for the survival of the Tibetan original in a different tongue. 
a failure to convey the historical and cultural complexities of a poem might mean that the act of translation has not borne fruit. And the poetic consciousness is still lost in Bardo. Despite my best endeavors to relay as much as possible, something in my translations remain uncaptured. This might be the indication of my own incompetence, but it is also a reflection of, of that time immemorial human struggle for expression. Great sublime poet himself, Gendin Chunpei, writes. Jetter knew she la nijero, Jetter knew it's in a skinjeroy. Around the Nijim Tawi, Chunamkan, Hamas Majopi, a lean diver shell. The closer it gets to the nature of things, the muter will be the words of the learned. Thus it's said that all phenomena subtle by nature are beyond the reach of expression, thought, and speech. Here, Genet Chimpil is specifically talking about the ineffability of ultimate nature of reality, what Anna Klein was talking about in the Dongpa lecture. That talking about that Nipushi, that Chunyi. He's also addressing that age old human conundrum of how we can truly communicate in words things that are beyond speech and thought. If we apply this profound statement to the task in hand, the act of translation faces this challenge in at least two ways. Firstly, the translator needs to work out what the writer is really saying. What ineffable thing he or she is trying to describe in words. The translator endeavors to claw their way cl ever closer to the reality of what is being expressed. Secondly, the translator might make, make also must make a tremendous effort to faithfully reproduce the foreign language of the writer. However, the words of the translator decrease in number and decline in felicity the closer one gets to the original language. Because of this twofold challenge, something might always be lost in translation or left in bardo between two languages. Still, like Jose Ortega Gasset's good utopian, we must continue to translate for the sake of enabling communication across linguistic and cultural boundaries. Until the day humanity gains enlightenment, which we're told, beyond language and contemplation, or discover Walter Benjamin's pure language, we translators must toil on in our task, blending cultures, languages, and minds by effecting rebirth of poetry and prose. To finish, I would like to express my immense gratitude to the conference organizers and thank you all for your time and, and attention. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>